Uh, so I've listened to a lot of your stuff, like the podcast you said you do with Heather, Comedic Behavior Therapy. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what led you to kind of this idea of combining comedy and therapy? So it's, it has to do with my day job. Um, right now I'm in school uh, as a counseling intern. Um, so mental health is kind of, it, it's like my main passion, I would say. And then I have a passion for comedy kind of as my own coping tool for things. Um, so then I was kind of had this vision of like, how do we bridge the gap between the two? Um, one, like ethically, and two, in a way that's like entertaining, but helpful at the same time. So it's kind of just, it's all like an experiment and how do we mix those two things? Cool. Oh, also, uh, since I've, I've watched through episode 15, are we going to, are you going to continue doing the podcast? It's, it's on a break right now. Um, we actually have an episode that was recorded and then um, isn't finished yet. So we have one that's like backlogged. Um, right time for everything, like in everybody's schedule to pick the podcast back up. But I am hoping that it will have future episodes and kind of be like bigger and better in season two. <laughs> Ooh, nice, season two. Uh, okay, so uh, if I'm correct, you're about a year into comedy, right? Yep. My year was actually, it might be today now that I think about Ooh. it. It was like either the 25th or the 26th last year that I went to my first open. So almost exactly, if not exactly. Uh, how yeah. do you, how does it feel to kind of be one year in looking back on things that have changed? Looking back on the first year um, kind of feels like a year that was stretched but much longer than that. Like I am sort of surprised at how this, this sounds really maybe like pessimistic. It's like reverse, <laughs> I guess, like hindsight pessimistic, but I'm surprised at how successful or how like how well things went in that first year um because i know a lot of people that kind of struggle to make things take off like the idea of doing a podcast would be really like scary but i like my attitude throughout the whole first year was like if i have an idea i'm gonna figure out a way to make it happen and so like i didn't wait to get booked in things as much as i figured out like how do we get a venue and just do our own thing and like the ticket sales will happen right and like same thing with the podcast it was like I like we had an idea and we were like we kind of kicked it around like how would we know we're ready to start it and I was like we're never gonna feel like we're ready to start it like until we start it <laughs> so <laughs> it's just that's kind of been my attitude and so I think year one that was kind of a big thing that I learned was that if you have a goal the that how that it happens will figure itself out like um, as long as you know where you are and where you want to go. So like the A through Z is all you need to know, the B through Y, it's like figure that out <laughs> as you go. <laughs> cool. Uh, and you're, you also do uh, improv, right? Yes. So I, I'm wondering what sort of, because on your podcast, you talk about sort of uh, the overlaps of people doing improv and how uh, you had like stand-up comedians get into improv and vice versa. What advice, I guess, would you give for someone either in improv who's looking to get into stand-up comedy or uh, vice versa? Yeah, it's kind of two different. I did I did improv to stand-up. So if you're going improv to stand-up, the biggest piece of advice I would say is probably um, I would, don't be afraid of bombing. Like, because when you're doing improv, you have scene partners and the goal is to make everybody else funnier. When you're doing stand up, you are you are there by yourself. <laughs> like, there's no <laughs> one to feed off of. Like, you can feed off the audience, obviously, but it's not the same as like if your mind blanks, you have someone else to give you something and then you're like, OK, we're back. The scene is going again. It's like if, you, if it's going poorly, you have to rely on yourself. So. Um, I think that fear of being up on stage by yourself is a natural part of the process. And if you want to go from improv to stand up, it's like you have to accept that fact. You have to accept that you are up there alone and it's going to go badly sometimes and you just have to be okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And uh, so I'm going to transition slightly. Uh, 
you uh, in your comedy, you mentioned a lot about uh, your childhood and being a father. How do you think, uh, let, let how do I phrase this? How uh, do you kind of pick what to take from your life and put it into your standup? This is a, a really good one. <laughs> so it's like, it's like anything else where there's a line and you have to through mostly through trial and error find where that line is um things from your life you, like when but like i said you're on stage alone when you're doing so you're in a very as it is so when you start pulling things from your life you're adding more vulnerability to that situation and so it's like you carry it right up to that line where you're like if i'm vulnerable this is no longer comedy this is therapy <laughs> um <laughs> So it's, it's your life. And I, I like to try to find what are the things that people can generally relate to. Most people can relate to having problems with their parent or struggling as a parent or things like that, like kids just being um, unpredictable. Like mm -hmm. most people can relate to that. But then what what individual spin can I put on it? Um, it's kind of like the the balance between giving people something they can understand and then being authentic to your own experience. So if you're that that's kind of where I find that line is that if if you're sharing something from your life that is so vulnerable that people can't understand it or you're kind of putting the burden on the audience now to like emotionally, uh, what am I trying to say? Like they're trying to like use so much of their like emotional, um, like their ability to carry emotions or like their empathy right like it, like making the audience like feel empathetic doesn't feel entertaining anymore it's like um save that for like an art film <laughs> <laughs> okay uh here's a random sort of question that i've been wondering uh when going through your podcast uh what is it and this is very random uh what is it about frogs that you like oh <laughs> I, they just, they seem to have a lot of things figured out. Like they're, they're always just chilling, whether they're in the mud, like in a pond, like they're just, they just seem like the most chill creatures. And like, they're kind of just like driven by like, when they need to eat, they eat. And like other, otherwise they're just like, they're just vibing. Like, <laughs> I think there's probably a lot that we can look at. Like sometimes maybe we just need to like, take, like metaphor relax a little <laughs> <laughs> yeah um i guess i don't really have an order to these questions now i'm kind of going all over the place uh but uh what is because you talk in uh at least in the podcast about how your daughter has uh like there was that bit where you said your daughter has kind of started picking up like things you say and like swears or different uh vocalisms has she started picking up anything from your comedy Oh, definitely. She's, I mean, she's kind of like, I, I probably shouldn't admit this, but she's the muse behind like a lot of the things that I end up using for material. So <laughs> um, it's one of those things where I'm like, I don't know if she's picking up more from me doing comedy or if I'm picking up more from her just being herself <laughs> to use for comedy. Um, but she definitely has an emphasis, I would say, like an above average emphasis than like kids her age of making people laugh. Like that's like her her main goal. That's where she does get into trouble sometimes with using language and things. Cause like my personal approach to parenting is like if you're home and you're with your family and you're like just in the like privacy of your own like living space, it's like what's what's the big deal if you use like extreme language yeah. to express yourself? It's like if that's what you need to say to get your point across. Then um teaching that distinction between environments is like that's where it gets tricky to where it's like she knows that mom and dad are gonna laugh if she calls someone a bitch but then if she goes to school and calls someone a bitch and then they're like does june cuss at home and we're like well yeah and they're like she called someone a bitch today and we're like well you gotta <laughs> you gotta take a step back here yeah uh do you think uh she uh will be involved in the, either the podcast one day or like become a comedian later on or? So that's funny. She's actually to a couple of our like practices that we've done for, cause I'm in uh, like my own improv group is called Problem Child. And I'm also a part of the 
Brock Lesnar's improv group um, to look a little bit bigger. So for both practices for Problem Child and the Illuminati, she's gone with me and she'll like participate in some of the games. So she's, oh. I'm already like indoctrinating into, <laughs> <laughs> into improv. Cool. So uh, here's kind of a, a, speculative, a speculative future question. Uh, I guess, where do you see yourself kind of down the line in like 10 or five years from now? Five years from now, I say um, I would like to have um, a consistent like media content platform going of some kind. So um, whether that's making the, the podcast more consistent and more regular, um, I also, I my background is in film actually, like before I went to school for counseling, I went to a film school. So um, I would really like to get into doing um, sketches. Um, I don't know how long of sketches. I kind of love like the short form sketch where it's just like, you know, you can make them into reels and yeah, that it can be a standalone thing or you can make it into a show or it's a, like an anthology. Um, so I think in five years, that's kind of where I see is I want to I want to build a little bit more of the um, recorded content. I think that's kind of what I what I would categorize it as. Like I focused a lot on live shows in the first year. So the next four or five, like I would like to do a little bit more of um, like uh, immortalized content, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, in 10 years, that's tough to like really see um, down the line. Honestly, the, the biggest dream would be like, um, you know, after five years of kind of working the Columbus scene, um, try to branch out to other areas like in the Midwest. Like I think the comedy scene like throughout the Midwest is kind of growing. Um, and who knows, you know, after five to 10 years of writing for stage or for screen, maybe I'll, you know, move to New York and work for SNL or something. I think that would be like, that would be like the pinnacle of, <laughs> that's like shooting for the moon and we'll see if we get there or not. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And you also, I, you mentioned that you were uh, involved in writing sketches, right? Or in sketch comedy. Yeah, um, we do. So sometimes like we do improv, improv, moment because it's like you really just go in and you don't necessarily know what you're going to let the scene play out um but we've done some sketch stuff too um scott wheeler does this monthly show um called something sketchy and very easy to like get into if you've like had any kind of experience with improv um so we've actually done several for that and some I've worked on writing. Um, some of them we've had. Um, Jacqueline Hughes is one of the members of Problem Child. Like they write some sketches. We've also had. Um, it was like a friend of a friend who like writes some things. So um, we all kind of collaborate usually in those situations. So to me, that's like the best way to write a sketch is like someone has the idea and the outline, and then a bunch of other people who kind of have some some kind of writing knowledge or at least just know like how to create a funny like sequence of events because to me that's the best if you're writing sketch comedy like yeah it's great to have all these like little moments to you're like how do we get to this moment but it really like the structure where it's like this event happens and this cascades into this one and then this one happens like it all has to has a have a thread through it and so that's one thing that I've I've enjoyed kind of exploring in sketch writing is like creating a story that actually does tell something and it's not just how many little gags can we fit into this five minutes it's like how do we tell a story within five minutes that makes you laugh along the way yeah I mean as much as I'm asking that just because I'm curious about it I'm also kind of want to get into the sketch thing so it's great to know kind of how uh the structuring goes how would you say you uh come up with ideas for either sketch or your stand-up? Is it through improv or? Sometimes, sometimes it's like that, um, where improv will be an idea that then expands onto things. Most of the time, my material comes from some way or another. Um, so it's either a situation that happens that I can then embellish into a joke or a or, or um, someone will say a phrase like this exact phrase has so much more to it than like what is used in this conversation. So that phrase becomes expanded into something. Um, not to sound too like artistic about it, but I think like like life is my greatest inspiration. 
<laughs> yeah. So um, further down uh, the line, I guess, this kind of goes back to where you see yourself in a sort of way. Uh, do you, uh, how do I phrase this? Do you, uh, if when you continue doing stand-up comedy and continue doing uh, therapy, uh, how do you sort of want to kind of find uh, a balance between those? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Comes a kind of a an ethical question after a certain ending the two, um, where as like a mental health professional, I have to be very clear about what like my credentials and my background and all that kind yeah. of thing is. So like. Right now, as a counseling intern, if I were to create content that was geared towards mental health, um, not having like causes an ethical problem. So right now, um, if I create content for comedy, it's very focused on comedy and kind of throwing in some mental health themes that are like, uh, you know, this is a struggle that can also be categorized as something funny. That, that that's kind of how we do it. Um, over time, like as I get like, you know, a higher level of licensure and things like that, I would like to create content that is more catered towards um, like helping people or like ad advice giving kind of thing, but done. You know, there's a lot of like content creators who do that, um, who are like licensed counselors who create content that's mostly mental health focused, but has some, it's done in like a way that's funny. So I think I, right now it's kind of the, the balance is, tilted more towards comedy and I like to tilt it more towards mental health. Um, but it's just a matter of uh, being cautious, I guess, about how you, how people perceive the information that I'm giving them. I would never want someone to take advice from me and then that changes like their entire life or the way they see things um, just because I wanted to make a joke, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> um, it's kind of like with great power comes great responsibility. Very true. Uh, so, uh, one thing that I learned through, uh, listening to your podcast with Heather, uh, you said, uh, you, well, at least at one point you mentioned that you were, you kind of wanted to get into musical comedy at one point, possibly. Do you still see yourself yes. doing that? 100%. Yeah. Um, I, I, am very much a jack of all trades. Like <laughs> I've dabbled in almost everything at this point. Um. So I have just enough musical knowledge that I've been talking with one of my friends and we're like, I think, I think this is the year where we start a band. So um, <laughs> I guess kind of stay tuned for that because like there's, and it's, it's gone from just the, hey man, we should start a band to like, what would we call our band? Like what genre of music would we play? Like who would play each instrument, all these things. So um, there's like the, the tides are turning, I think towards where music is gonna be uh, something. I think after, after the next couple of shows we have, I feel like I, I, I foresee taking like a little bit of a break from live shows to kind of focus on some other formats. Nice. Well, I'm looking forward to see what happens with that. Uh, who would you say uh, your growing up and getting into comedy, your greatest comedic influencers are? Yeah. Um, I know when I was growing up, uh, my family was pretty religious, so if we listened to comedy, it was more like uh, clean comedians. So um, like Tim Hawkins and Brian Regan um, were ones that like my parents would just be like, they would turn it on and they'd be like, this is okay. Um, I remember like, uh, you know, now he's kind of controversial, but now I'm blanking on his name. Oh, Dane Cook. I remember seeing some like Dane Cook stuff uh, back in the day and being like, this is hilarious. Um, as I got older, um, kind of the most recent like surge, I guess, an in interest in stand-up comedy started when I watched um, Taylor Tomlinson's special. Um, God, what's it called? Um, Look at you. It was that was the, that was the special that kind of got me to where I was like, this would be such a like a, such a fun way to spend your time, like to to write based on your life and perform for people and and things like that. So then I started listening to um, comedy podcast so it started with um i found theo vaughn's podcast and like just the way his mind works is like i can't even comprehend it sometimes <laughs> i like can't tell if it's intelligence or ignorance and like 
<laughs> it's it's so funny. But that kind of led me down a rabbit hole of all of the the comedy podcasts because I was like unaware that comedy podcasts existed. So I listened to Theo Vaughn's for a little while. I listened to Two Bears, One Cave with uh, Tom Segura and Bert Kreischer. Um, and then the the style that I liked the most and the, the what I would like wanted to emulate when I created my own podcast was Bad Friends with Andrew Santino and Bobby Lee. Um, so I'd say all of them in like the way they do their podcast and the way they perform on stage like they would all be influences um obviously like a, an obvious answer is like i think shane gillis is hilarious um i also um jim jeffries was like a, a big influence and tom segura as far as like what they make jokes about because they're both like married with kids that's where a lot of their material comes from so Watching both of them, I like took a lot of notes on like how do you turn your life into stand-up material, and so they they were both really influential on like my writing style, at least for stand-up. Cool. Uh, going back and towards the podcast side of the questions, uh, something I've been wondering when listening to comedic behavior therapy is, is it you or is it Heather? Like, how do you come up with and who comes up with like all those segments, like the ASMR debate and the I forget the name of the other one, the one where you're trying to make someone laugh. <laughs> um, uh, mischief meditation, that's the other one. Yes. Um, so we kind of, I would say that I, I like to have somewhat of an idea. I like to have segments, like kind of have a little bit more of a structure. Heather hates having the structure most of the time <laughs> um, or doing like segments. So I'm definitely the one that pushes segments more and then she kind of pushes more um, like interviewing the guests, like doing more like formal questions and things like that. So it kind of balances it out. Um, yeah, a lot of, I either like think of segment ideas. I actually have a bunch written down in my notes app that we haven't used yet that like, Ooh. it's just something will come to me where I'm like, what if we did this? And sometimes we try something and it's like not as funny as we were going to be. And then we're like, well, this is like a one-time segment. But um, yeah, like in, in the future of the podcast, I'd like to have a little bit more of a... Um, a regularity with some of the segments um but the, the problem is is it's early enough in its development too that like we've gotten a lot of feedback from people on which segments like the audience thinks is funny so it's like it's really like at this point we're just like throwing things out there and seeing what sticks um which is a it's a fun stage to be in but it's also like uh that we haven't gotten like the dopamine of people being like oh like bring this segment back <laughs> Well, I, I'd like to see both of those segments continue in the future, hopefully, because <laughs> I love them. Yeah. I had another idea of like sharing things that we like found on the internet, um, like a show and tell almost, but with like memes or like just the most ridiculous like content we can <laughs> find somewhere else. Um, that kind of started, I don't know if this is going to like spoil anything for the future, but I saw this video of this guy like doing chiropractor, like he was a chiropractor, but using like a, a hammer and like a like a piece of wood on people's back. Oh, I think I've seen <laughs> like, that actually. Like I just want to show stuff like that to Heather with no context and be like, "What do you think of this?" <laughs> cool. So you also uh, you edit the podcast, right? Mm -hmm. And do all the. How long does that like typically take you to like go through an episode and get it out onto YouTube? On average, it takes. I would say like on an easy episode, it's probably like four extra hours of work beyond oh, recording. Wow. Um, and that's part of what led to taking a break is because like uh, as school was picking up and we were doing live shows and things and then trying to edit the podcast, all of that, it was like, um, and being a parent, like balancing everything, I was like, I think it's time to outsource this, <laughs> this task to somebody else. Um, but it's tough because right now it's like there's no, like, getting a podcast off the ground there's no ad revenue at this point or things like that to where it's like, like we can easily hire like an editor so it's like um i feel like i would never ask somebody to edit something for free when i know that i wouldn't do that like so i'm like i'm not gonna like put out feelers of like who wants to do all this work that i'm saying is too much and we can't afford to pay you for it but um it's just it, that like wouldn't feel right. So it's kind of like balancing like what we can actually feasibly accomplish. Cool. Uh, so 
I'm not sure. I don't want to keep you here forever. I have a few more questions. No, you're uh, good. Cool. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, you have uh, siblings, two siblings, right? Yes. I have a brother who's like two years younger than me and then a sister who is 16. Uh, I guess, how do they, uh, do they influence your comedy? Do they, uh, yeah, I guess that's the question. How do they influence your comedy? Yeah, so I would say that my, my brother and I, when we were growing up, like we, we were homeschooled. So like, it was kind of like, we didn't have this whole big circle of friends. So we influenced each other quite a bit growing up. Um, so my sense of humor, um, kind of like, I, I sort of credit him with like helping my imagination to grow. Cause like as a kid, I was very literal with things. Like I just like was focused on like what was actually happening or like more like tangible things. And he was always very imaginative. Like would, he had a, a whole, I think he'd be okay with me saying this, but he had an entire world that he created and there was like a history for it and like all these things. And consistently like I think that he probably has the brain of a, an author um if he wanted to <laughs> wanted to get into that but um so it kind of we like fed off of each other with creating some of these things that were like more like um and we had for a couple like tapes that we recorded throughout the years because it was back in the cassette tape days so we had this little like Fisher Price cassette player that had a microphone and you could record over whatever tape was in there. So we would take like old tapes like that our parents like didn't want anymore. And then we'd record over it. And we did like um, one very like stream of consciousness. It was like, if we thought it, we recorded it. And like, I, that, I don't even know if it's like we're having a conversation or like, I don't even know how to categorize that. It was almost like audio sketches, I guess. It was basically like a fake news um like broadcast and it's if I was gonna bring anything back from my childhood it would probably be that I was like I've had lots of lots of conversations with him about like it, like we need to bring this back whatever um so definitely like my brother influenced my I guess the development of like how I my sense of humor of an age gap that uh probably not as much but it's funny because now that she's getting older, like she kind of has like some of the same kind of thing. Like whenever I like visit my family, like some of the conversations we get into, I'm kind of like, you, you have the gene too. Like, <laughs> but I don't think either one of them, she's actually, um, she does some plays. Like she doesn't necessarily do comedy, but she definitely does like performing arts. She's more of like into like theater. Um, so we've kind of connected some on, on that front, just the kind of, you know, what it's like to get up in front of people and pretend to be somebody else. So yeah, it kind of runs in the family, I guess, just the like the comedy and performing arts. Nice. Uh, so I guess like did, did uh like did they in their minds, do you think they foresaw you becoming a comedian? No, really. <laughs> I really don't. Um, I think the uh the film background, it's like they're kind of used to that idea that like like creating something. Um a brother actually helped with some of my film school um but as far as doing comedy specifically it's like we've always talked about creating comedy content um but just just doing stand-up comedy i think it came out of left field um for them but i was like for me i saw it as a strategy it's, it's like a, kind of a networking thing because the the comedy community is very it has it has its you know the how tight knit it is is an advantage yeah. and a disadvantage sometimes. If you approach comedy community in Columbus correctly, it can be the most valuable asset. Um, very like close community, very supportive. Um, you just have to know how to like avoid the dramatic situations, which mostly involve not being someone who starts drama. <laughs> like if you approach it, if you approach people with like kindness and respect nine times out of 10, probably more than that, you're going to get kindness and respect back. So um, getting into the company, yeah, was probably like a surprise to my family just because like the that was something we like, had never like had much of like interest in, I guess like mutually. But um, for me, that's always how I've seen it is it's like, I want to meet other funny people who, you know, might have similar goals that I do. And 
when you're all at an open mic for four hours talking. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Something else I've been wondering about is because I've done like since I started working at Slapstick, I've done all this research on comedians in Columbus and I didn't know Columbus was such like a big city for comedy. Uh, how do you because uh, I know you mentioned there's like a lot of uh, it's easier to get into like improv there uh, than other places, because I believe you said there are like places that do open mics and uh, improv games. How would you uh, say? the city has uh, shaped your uh, comedy and improv and your work. Yeah, it's, <clears throat> I think because of how big it is and because of how close a lot of the people are, it's it's sort of like a family to where you have some family members who you really get along with, some that like are don't get along with each other, some that you might not get along with. And I think navigating that dynamic between everybody has helped me to know what I want out of comedy and what I don't want, or like how I want to contribute and how I don't want to contribute. It's helped me to define uh, kind of what I view as like my place in that broader community. Um, this, the, the first year, like I said, I kind of, I, you know, I was trying to teach myself the mindset that like, if I want something to make it happen. Um, and in order to do that, you have to ha be connected with other people, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have to go down like the mainstream there. Um, because there's kind of like one way of doing things people would say is like, uh, like consider them like comics comics, where it's like yeah. comedians who, who do comedy for other comedians to enjoy. And that kind of gets you those more like mainstream opportunities, mainstream recognition. Uh, and throughout the first year of doing comedy, I was like the mainstream way of kind of approaching comedy becomes like extremely difficult. And that's where you end up with a lot of like big ego and, and drama. So I was kind of like, what other paths are there to achieving your own goals that like, you know, other people will kind of be pulled along by that. So I, I've kind of like in, in setting goals for year two of comedy, I view it as kind of cultivating those alternative paths like I would kind of like to see somewhat of like an alternative comedy kind of scene in Columbus to where um, some of the divides that you see between stand-up and improv um, kind of come from that mainstream sort of thinking in both of those so the alternative involves blending some of those like mediums um, so like that, that's something I do in a lot of live shows is blending like the improv and stand-up um, and people who view comedy as like a tool within a, a box, I guess. So like creating, creating content, creating um, comedy isn't necessarily to me the only tool. And that's kind of where I consider like, there's a lot of people in Columbus who think that way. That, and, and I think that those who I consider alternative um, to the people who just s simply want to do stand up and be successful as like stand up comedians. Um, and there's obviously there's nothing wrong with that, but it's that's something that I learned in the Columbus comedy community is that there's enough people who really that's their main focus. And that was like when I realized that that was not my main focus in doing comedy, it was like it was so freeing to me because it was like I was like, this is the kind of artist I am and this is the kind of artist I'm not. And that's like when you find those moments like as a creator, it's like it's the best feeling because you're like, I don't have to pretend anymore. <laughs> Yes, that, that's something I can relate to a lot, too. Uh, so I guess kind of outside of comedy, do you have any uh, artists that you have, you would say, have inspired you or that you look up to? Yeah. Um, well, that's that's tough because it's like there's different kinds of art that I find inspiring. Um, let's see. <laughs> As far as like writing, um, I just read the book, and it's it's an old book now at this point. But I read the book American Gods by Neil Gaiman, okay. and that that story and that writing, um, it's a, a lot of people I've talked to about that book. They didn't like the writing style, but I was like, it's because you're not you don't see <laughs> what's what's going on. You don't understand. Um, so I think I like I like writing styles kind of like that, like uh, building a world, building characters, and things like that. Um, musically, I we would probably have another hour of me talking about music. Um, 
my influences kind of change over time and it also like changes across genres um i'm trying to think in like in like the past year i mean we're doing a, a punk show tonight um so oh, that's yeah. kind of been my my like current obsession i guess is more of like like punk music or like um so like my chemical romance and um green day like oh, yeah. some some of like that that type of genre like right okay. now i think is kind of like the most that's like what I'm listening to. And so it was like, when we had an opportunity to do a show, I was like, why don't we do a punk show? Um, yeah, visual, visual arts, um, like film. I've always loved Wes Anderson movies, um, mostly just because that is someone who knows who he is, right? Like at, as an artist, like he knows exactly, he has, he has his style and he sticks to it like a religion. So <laughs> I've always respected that, that it's like, he, he knows what, he, what he's making. Um, God, what else? I, I also like, um, as far as like, more like fine art, I've always loved Impressionism. Um, and just the kind of idea that art doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be like um, realism. It's like, if if the art is created in such a way that your subjective experience of it can can like add to the art, um, I've always loved that, that approach to making art. And I think it, it, it influences my comedy in a way that I probably wouldn't be able to articulate <laughs> with words. <laughs> um, because I think when I, when I write for stand up, that's one of the biggest things for me is I want to write in a way to where the audience has a subjective experience of it that I kind of, <laughs> in words, create like brush strokes that might not be clear if you're looking at it up close, but if you take a step back, it's like, then you see the whole picture. And um, then it's, it's, like I said, I don't know if I could articulate like how that does influence my writing style, but it definitely, it, it's a mindset that I have when I write jokes that I'm like, how can I create this image in someone's mind that might not be super clear at first? And then it, then it just comes into fruition. And then it's like, that's where the joke is, is when that image is like, becomes clearer somehow. Cool. Uh, going into kind of the writing style, because uh, I know you mentioned you take things from your life and uh, improv can influence your stand up. What is, would you say, kind of is your pro uh, like physical process for like writing your stand up? Like, do you have a notebook or something or do you? Yeah, I guess like what what sort of form do you use to kind of put things down either on paper or in your head? If so I have. I, I put it all in my notes app on my phone because I always have my phone with me. So if something, like I said, real life inspires me the most. So if something in real life happens then I'm like, I don't have time to write a joke right now, but I do have time to write down one sentence. So I'll write down that phrase or that sentence or something. And then when I go back to like where I'm writing for like an open mic or a show or something, then I'll go through and I'll, I'll see those phrases that I'm like, okay, what was the joke here? Um, and then I worked for a little while on trying to write in a very specific style. So a very specific cadence to where it was like premise, punchline, tag, like premise, punchline, tag. Um, and I think that that was good, not for like a long-term way of approaching jokes, but it helped me to where it was like whatever phrase I had in my head, when I forced myself to follow that format, now it happens a little bit more naturally um, to where it might not always be in that exact order, but it's like, I know that I'm like, I have premise time, which usually is super short. Um, you'll lose an audience very quickly if your premise is super long. Um, so I was like, how do I set up this premise? And then getting like the beats of the laughs kind of be became more natural when I um, followed that format like more rigidly in the beginning. Um, so now it's like, it's not so much a, um, you know, I kind of had like almost like an outline that I would write where I was like, I think I literally like I would have a notebook and I was like, one, two, three, one, two, three, <laughs> writing them all down. Um, now it's kind of. Uh, I'll take that phrase and then I'm like, where does this phrase fall into the joke? Is this part of the premise? Or is this part of the, the punchline? Um, and then I just build on that. Usually I write the joke all the way out exactly how I want to say it. And then cut it down um so basically like 
all the unnecessary words have to go. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's kind of the first filter that it goes through. Then it's, is there a shorter way to say this sentence? And then I do that. So I kind of cut it down to as, as few words as it can possibly be. Um, and with an improv background too, a lot of like the physical acting things out becomes really important um, because that's what I'm used to. I have jokes to where the material, it's like, yeah, you could say this or you could act it out on the stage. And like, then it's like, then you're cutting down even more, right? <laughs> so yeah. I end up with this like basically bullet point format to where it's like, I have like two words to remember what this part of the joke is, three words to remember this part, one word for this. Um, and it also helps to kind of build the memorization too, um, because I obviously don't want to be sitting there reading <laughs> the paragraph that I wrote initially. Um, so it's kind of like I cut the joke down to its most basic form, um, and then go there. And it's kind of a it's an ongoing writing process. You try it at a mic, how it comes out of your mouth is like like I didn't like that, and so it's changing it over time and. Then, um, to be quite honest, I've had most of the best writing ideas the night before a show happens. Um, Interesting. So it's, if I know that a show is coming up the next day, it's like the night before, it's like, <laughs> it's like when you're a kid and it's the night before Christmas. <laughs> like, I'm just like, I can't sleep. And I know that if I go to sleep with these ideas in my head, then I won't remember them in the morning. So I just end up staying up at like 11 or 12, writing down all these jokes. And then I'm like, great, now I have a set for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. So I guess those are pretty much all my questions. Uh, is there anything you would like to, I guess, plug or say is coming up or anything uh, that you want to say on the platform? Uh, um, one would be that uh, some form of like the podcast will be coming back soon. So um, if you want to yeah. catch up on all the, all the previous episodes, um, comedic behavior therapy is on basically anywhere that you listen to podcasts, Apple, Spotify, YouTube. Um, and then the next couple live shows I'm going to be in, um, on February 24th, I'm going to be part of Hot Fuss, um, Brock Lesnar and somebody. Um, that's at Up From Space. And then I'm actually doing um, Stand Up Surprise at the Nest Theater, March 7th, I believe it is. And then on March 22nd, um, Basically the live, it's not a live podcast, but it's kind of the same brand, like the live version of the podcast. Um, we call it Cheaper Than Therapy for the live show. That's going to be at Upfront Performance Space on March 22nd. So that's kind of the next couple months for me. Nice. Well, thank you so much, Tristan, for meeting with me and uh, talking about comedy and your life and everything. Yeah, thanks for having me. This has been a lot of fun.